A very good evening and a warm welcome to UBC News tonight on this third day of April 2024. I'm Lorraine Masika Kazimoto and my colleague Elizabeth Nakakoni on sign language interpretation. Tonight we bring you tonight's news and it goes as follows. The Constitutional Court has dismissed a petition filed by a group of activists aimed at nullifying the recently passed Anti-Homosexuality Act. However, in its ruling, the court struck down some sections of the act, including Section 3, Subsection 2, Section 9 and Section 11, section, Subsection 2, on the grounds that they violate rights to health, housing and privacy, especially concerning reporting. We have more details in this story. Following the passing of the anti-homosexuality law, by the president, Fox Odo, U.S. Sibudama member of parliament, Nicholas Opio, lawyer, Chintu Nyango, Ugandan ambassador to South Africa, along with Andrew Mwenda, Slivia Tamale, a law professor at Makere University and others, filed a petition in the constitutional court challenging the law. The case was filed against the Attorney General, Pastor Matt of Semp of Makere Community Church, and Engineer Sibin Langa of Family Life Network. In a ruling read by the Deputy Chief Justice Richard Ibutera, the panel of the five justices of the Constitutional Court declined to nullify the act, stating that it upholds the norms, culture, and religion of the country, which must be respected. It follows then that conduct that deviates from the cultural manifestation of any life, language, literature, music, religion, traditions, and customs operates at close purposes with the right to human dignity. The notion of an individual's unfettered sexual autonomy defies the logic of offenses like incest, bestiality, and other natural offenses that are still on our statute books. The court also viewed that the enactment of the act was aimed at protecting children and the vulnerable members from the acts of homosexuality, asserting that the parliament didn't violate any of its rules in passing the law. That limitation on the right to non-discrimination is proportional to the child protection objective of active homosexuality act. It is demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society as envisaged under Article 43.2 of the Constitution. Justices also highlighted concerns about the physical harm caused by the anal sex, especially to males, and its implications on the government's health care budget. 13.7 of the ANS in Kampala, Uganda, we are found to be living with HIV. Anal sex causes physical harm. HIV infection represents serious harm to physical and mental health. Well, as the court found that the rights to privacy was not infringed upon, the mandatory reporting provisions infringes on some of the rights. Court also dismissed allegations of infringements on the rights to freedom of expression and association, arguing that those freedoms are manifested verbally or in writing, as indicated in the Constitution, not through sexual expression. We do not find the impeded sections of the Anti-Homosexuality Act <clears throat> authorize a lawful entry unto such onto or such interference with the person's body, home or other act, correspondence or communication. However, the court decided to strike down Section 329.11.2 due to their prohibitions of access to housing and medical care, which could subject individuals to mental health issues and inadequate standards of living. We take the view that the reporting obligation under Article 14 would indeed have a chilling deterrent effect on access to health care by homosexual patients. Despite declining to nullify the entire anti-homosexuality law, since the case was a public interest case, no orders were made on costs. After receiving the decision, the petitioners vowed to appeal the decision in the Supreme Court. How can a judge make a judgment on such an important matter based on public sentiment rather than on the Constitution? Not once has one human being been arrested for recruiting children into homosexuality. So it is really an attempt by the court to throw some things at the public to try and ameliorate what I think is 
a very poor judgment. However, the respondents in this matter expressed joy at the court is ruling. To me, it was a perfect moment in court to interrogate Pepe Onzima. How much did she spend on getting a sex surgery? Not only that, they must have a lifetime of uh, hormones. They must have a, a lifetime of gels. Homosexuality destroys individuals. Homosexuality destroys families. Homosexuality destroys society. Deborah Nama Monde, UBC News. President Yuri Museveni has tasked leaders at all levels to preach the gospel of household income generation to the masses in order to uplift communities. The president said this while hosting a group of exemplary farmers from the nine villages of Gomba and Zimbabwe districts at his Kisozi farm. He was accompanied by the First Lady and Minister of Education and Sports, Janet Kataha Museveni. President Museveni has called upon leaders at all levels to advocate for household income generation among the masses. Speaking at his Kisoze farm, where he hosted exemplary farmers from Gomba and Zimbabwe districts, the president highlighted the pivotal role of leaders in fostering prosperity at the grassroots level. <laughs> Drawing from his experiences dating back to the 1960s, the president emphasized the need for embracing wealth creation strategies, particularly in the agricultural sector. Mobilization is a fair, and a fair. It's a good thing. It's a good the president rolled out initiatives such as providing livestock, agricultural resources, and financial support in villages which benefited include Chirasi, Kisozi A, Kisozi B, Ubutugu, Luntuku A, Luntuku B, Kajumido, Kasozi, and Chikuma Dumbo. Era general katumba genda kujja mukore program yokoro uguto bo mbiyaro biyamu. Genda oxine kamazi tu gaje mukatonga tu gateke kuchosi chafu kuchosi tu On her part, the project coordinator Sara Narwanga lauded the scheme's impact, noting its substantial benefits. Gafne biyo kulunda, gafne biyo kulima. Abamuzei abasoma kuteki ni kwa wane tools na denera bide. Just ka business ya soma kape ntre ba muwebio kubadja. Ya soma echalani ni ba muwechalani ila wabaina sente ziba ingiza. Beneficiaries of the project also shared inspiring stories of transformation. Nine muanyi yika bili. Yike ze bili. Nzijamu emilio ni avili. Obabili muetano kwa wezitio. Buli sezoni. Buli sezoni. Buli sezoni. Ato muaka. O muaka, mfune milioni agawe la atano. Nse chino chendi, yegwe. Nari muavu nyo. Nga sina chemani. Eranga naka yumba kensulamu. Madamu naruanga akamani. Na yekati, tuse kumutindo, uruo kubagwe. 
Members of Parliament from Gomba and Zimbabwe districts express gratitude for the President's visionary leadership and pledge to mobilize communities to embrace poverty alleviation programs. Justin Nakami, UBC News. President Yuri Museveni has said that the government is committed to promoting science and technology as one major way to enhance development. This was contained in the president's message delivered for him by the Right Honorable Robina Nabanja, the Prime Minister of Uganda, during a 40-year celebration and fundraising drive for Bonjera Girls Secondary School in Intungamo District. The theme for the celebrations was consolidating a holistic girl-child education for sustainable development. The President of the Republic of Uganda on the second... President Museveni lauded Bonjera Girls Secondary School for providing quality education to students, thus playing a part in the development of the country. The president says that NRM government supports sciences because through scientific research, government is able to generate innovations to support industrial growth. Industries provide jobs and thus the tax base of the country is widened, hence spurring socio-economic transformation. As we continue moving through the fourth industrial revolution with the developments in the ICT sector and artificial intelligence, secondary schools have a key role to play and coming up with innovations that support industrial growth. The Bishop of South Ankole Diocese, Right Reverend Ahimbisiwe Nathan, lauded President Museveni for supporting the development of the country. We came to build, and we have done some work before. And I know, by the grace of God, you are going to add more. He says, when God says, yes, it is your season. When you know the mission, you know the reason, you use the season. So the woman member of parliament in Tungamo, Jocelyn Kamateneti, asked the government to support the district, especially in the sector of education and infrastructure. Computers, as to you know, computer lab. We really need more, and if possible, government kuya kubasa kutkonjera and the computer lab bakaje expanding. I'm very sure we shall be grateful. The Prime Minister assured the people of Nyamunoka Town Council that the government will address issues raised, such as inadequate power supply and the need for more teachers at the school. The president contributed 80 million shillings cash towards the construction of a malt purpose hall for the school. Bonjeragao Secondary School is famous for producing prominent personalities in the country, including the First Lady and the Minister for Education, Mrs. Janet Katam Seveni, among others. And it is evident that most of our girls here continue to drop out of school on account of failing to meet school fees. So as a way of addressing this, uh, uh, a development of a circle as an idea has been birthed by the old girls, though we are constrained with access to resources. So we therefore implore you, Right Honorable Prime Minister, that you can give us a sum of 500 million shillings into this project. Uh, the Minister for Education and Sports and also the First Lady, Janet Kataho Museveni, has advised parents not to neglect their parenting role while guiding their children. This message was delivered by the Minister for Health, Jane Ruth Cheng, during the launch of the Safe Screens, Safe Kids initiative, initiated by the Church of Uganda, aiming to instill more values among children. The Church of Uganda has launched the Safe Screen, Safe Kids initiative aiming to revive moral values among children, especially regarding their television and social media consumption. During the initiative's launch, Minister of Education and Sports Janet Kata Hamuseveni, represented by the Minister for Health Jen Ruth Cheng, commended the Church of Uganda for their campaign to monitor children's social media consumption. I am so appreciative of the Anglican Church in Uganda for taking a societal and community-based approach to considering and addressing the best use and regulation of these contemporary forms of communication. If this is done correctly, 
it will undoubtedly have many advantages and benefits to all of us. Kataha emphasized that despite technological advancement, parents must actively groom their children to thrive in the modern world. I urge you all to purpose to use technology in moderation so as to mitigate its effects and to avoid becoming over-dependent. The First Lady noted that many children spent excessive time on their internet during the COVID-19 lockdown and urged everyone to fulfill their responsibilities. Regrettably, there was a significant disadvantage in the use of these media and communication platforms due to the shift in schooling towards online learning. Archbishop of the Church of Uganda, Dr. Samuel Stephen Kazimba Mogalu, asserted that religious leaders must utilize all platforms to ensure the revival of moral values among children. We are not going to work with only uh, our church, but even other religious leaders, and also media, uh, different medias, not only Church of Uganda television, but all other, to ensure the parents are sensitized. To ensure that the children are occupied. Now, when they come back for their holidays, what do they watch? Sometimes they have a lot of time and they are suffering from what to do. Minister for ICT and National Guidance, Dr. Chris Bariomonsi, pledged the ministry support for the Safe Screen Safe Kids Initiative and advised media houses to carefully vet information before broadcasting. We appreciate the church, Church of Uganda, and we support this campaign and we shall partner with them to see treat that the campaign succeeds. For the campaign to succeed, it will require a merit stakeholder approach. In other words, we shouldn't leave it to Church of Uganda alone as the initiators, but all of us must have a buy-in. The Safe Screen Safe Kids Initiative spearheaded by the Church of Uganda aims to nurture moral values among children. Sada Mubale, Andrew Sebira, UBC News. The Budget Committee of Parliament has tasked the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development to produce accountability of 4.05 trillion shillings spent without clear guidelines. The funds were spent in financial year 2023-2024 under an arrangement of statutory revision which seemed new to the members of parliament. The MPs questioned the legal framework which led to the expenditure from the consolidated fund. Despite apologies by the Minister of State for Finance, Henry Musasizi, who claimed that the expenditure was illegal. The approved budget for the financial year 2023-2024 was 52.737 trillion. A supplementary of 3.49 trillion was approved to support the same budget accordingly. However, the Minister of State for Finance, in charge of general duties, Henry Musasizi, informed the MPs sitting on the Parliamentary Committee on Budget that an addition of 4.05 trillion was drawn from the consolidated fund under the disguise of statutory revision to support the budget for the financial year 2023-2024. In accounting, I've never had something like statutory revision. This surprised the MPs who wanted to understand the phrase statutory revision. Is it a budgeting issue or a legal matter? PSST, what is a statutory revision? What do you mean by statutory revision? I want the PSST. But this is a, a revision done by the Treasury to pay the statutory obligations and bring them to Parliament for approval, Mr. Chairman. So Treasury can sit there and revise a budget. Can we back that with some law? Minister Henry Musasizi did not allow the debate to prolong, apologizing to the MPs for what he described as a lacuna. There is some anomaly there. And what we have decided going forward, whenever we want to do the statutory revisions, we shall be bringing it to Parliament for approval. Proceed, uh, 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 Chair. Uh, uh, Colleagues, it is clear. Let's proceed. The, the Minister has made it simple. There is an anomaly. Mm. There has been a lacuna there. It was a, I can say there was an error, a gross error 
which can turn amount to abuse of office. Minister Musasi, however, reveals how it is not the first time the ministry spends funds in the same spirit and asks that parliament takes interest on the procedures used. I think the committee needs time to think through it and understand it better. The chairperson of the Budget Committee of Parliament, Patrick Isiaji, has requested the Finance Ministry to avail the accountability for the funds to aid in the investigations. So it's not coming out clear, and that's why we have adjourned the meeting. An investigation is done. We have asked Finance to do the investigation where the money went, and we also do our independent investigation. Then we shall have a joint meeting. The officials in the Ministry of Finance accompanied by the PSST Ramadan Gobi had appeared before the Budget Committee to present the 58.3 trillion budget estimates for the financial year 2024-2025. Daniel Mugoya, Gloria Gwitabinji, UBC News. UBC News tonight. Now the Inspector General of Government, Betty Kamia, has promised to intervene in the salary increment of drivers, secu secretaries, askaris and office attendants of various ministries. This follows a plea from employees as a strategy of tackling corruption effectively. In an engagement with the IGG, drivers, secretaries, askaris and office attendants voiced their concerns about the prevalence of corruption. We are dying. Don't ask. We are fellow Ugandans. We are people like you. So we just deserve a better payment. I went to the bank. I bank with Baroda. I was told the money I earn cannot make me get two million as a loan. And we are also questioning that with this government that you're giving us, please split it into monthly month basis. The consultation that we get, it should be split monthly basis. So that when I go to the bank, it will help me to get a higher amount of money that can help me do other things. We are requesting, if possible, let our salary be increasing. Because if the salary is increasing, I hope corruption will go out. Me, I work with engineers. I'm under engineers. You know all engineers, all scientists, their are salaries where the Inspector General of Government, Betty Kamia, promised to lobby for the salary increment. But as an Inspector of Government, we shall also emphasize to government and to the President himself that the question of salaries must be addressed uh, uh, seriously because it is a serious motivator or demotivator or even a, 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 a fueling corruption. That is what most people have said. Kamia asked the employees to be watchdogs of the corrupt for better services. Corruption money, you know? It is so temporary. The, the, the corruption money that you can get today on the excuse of your small job, or small salary, it depends on you holding that job today. But tomorrow you don't know whether you will hold it. Sudat Kaye, UBC News. Right. The list is with the Attorney General. This is a response by the Leader of Opposition in Parliament, Joel Senyonyi, to the Minister of State for Children and Youth Affairs, Honorable Balam Barugahara, who is pursuing a move to unconditionally release the supporters of the National Unity Platform Party. Minister Balam addressed Parliament shortly after taking oath as an ex-official and reiterated to the MPs how the NUP party failed to avail the list of the supporters allegedly under detention. Balam and other ex-officials recently appointed in the cabinet took oath during today's afternoon session, chaired by the Deputy Speaker of Parliament, Thomas Taewa. I, Dr. Mona Kenneth, Swear in the name of the Almighty God. Parliament, on Wednesday afternoon, witnessed the administration of oaths by the recently appointed members of the cabinet. 
that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the constitution of Uganda. The new members were asked by the Deputy Speaker Thomas Tayewa to present their respective maiden speeches. And I pray that all of us in this house, God will support and help us to remind us of our duties on both sides of the house to continue to serve and serve together for the good of our country. Thank you very much and God bless. The Minister of State for Children and Youth Affairs, Balam Barugahara, accused the National Unity Platform Party for failing to provide the list of the alleged supporters who are under detention. Minister Balam admits that the NOOP supporters have undergone detention without trial and wants President Yoweri Museveni to order for their release. When I was in the appointments committee, the speaker requested me to speak to His Excellency to ensure that NOOP supporters are released. The president in his own voice and video, he said, give me the list. I requested the National Unity Platform to avail the list. Hope the uh, uh, leader of opposition is here. I'm yet to get it. But the leader of opposition, Joel Senyonyi, describes the request by Minister Balam as derived by excitement. Senyonyi says the list was given to the Attorney General after the matter was extensively discussed in Parliament. And we tabled that list here in Parliament. We gave it to the Attorney General. Court is processing many of these matters and we have asked that they be released on bail. This caused drama in the House, calling for the patience of the presiding officer to calm the situation. Uh, on, 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 right, on, right Honourable on, Speaker. Honourable, Honourable Minister. No. On, honorable colleagues, please, 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 please. I hereby direct you, sir, you expunge the submission of the Honorable Senate. Honorable Baram, continue, please. During the same sitting, the newly elected woman representative for Dokolo District, Sarah Aguti, also took oath. Sarah replaces the late Cecilia Ogwal, who died recently. David Ochoa bounces back in the 11th parliament to represent Agule County in Palisa District after court nullified the former MP, Polycarp Ogwal, over fake academic qualifications. Uh, the people of Dokolo, they are okay, but only that they have one problem. My people are dying in the lake. I want this house to help me. Colleagues, we are back here to work for the country. Thank you for accepting us and receiving us. And I pledge that as a representative of the young people, our pace is set. And we look forward to seeing how best Uganda can fully utilize its natural resources to fast track our development. Daniel Mugoya, Gloria Gutabinji, UBC News. The newly appointed Minister of State in charge of Youth and Children Affairs, Bala Mbarugahara, has assumed his office after a smooth handover from his predecessor, Sarah Mateke. The event, hosted at the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, was presided over by Helen Asamo. This is part of the material that he's going to use in his office, the Children's Amendment Act, uh, the Youth Act. The incoming Minister in charge of Youth and Children Affairs, Bola Marukahara Atenyi, has been handed office. May he keep our flag high, he keep it high wherever he will go. I know he has done it and he will continue to do it. The handover event at the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development has been attended by a section of leaders and technocrats. The new Minister of State for Youth and Children Affairs. I think that it is fair to say that this particular one is more of a youth minister than a children's minister. As a technical team and on the behalf of the people you see here, we are all committed to work with you. We are all in this business. We would like to see a situation where we all celebrate success, but also look at the challenges and see how we keep improving. Paying attention to the youth-related challenges is a vital assignment being handed to Balam and the team. Whether it is our leader or is whatever, there are a lot of rumors you'll get in cabinet, but please drive the agenda of the Minister of Gender. Onewe Warugahara, Uganda has really transformed. We have peace, we have security, the infrastructure is really good and we shouldn't take it for granted. 
On her behalf, the outgoing minister, state in charge of youth and children affairs, Sarah Mateke, recalls her two and a half years tenure at this office. I just want to tell you that the only worst time I have had here that I can never forget is the day when we have youth day. If you want pressure, that is the day. Do you know that you have a youth day on 12th August and there are no funds and the youth are telling you we want council. Council must happen and you have nowhere to get the money. So since you have the, you've been a businessman, maybe you'll be lending them so that these things happen. The new office holder, Dr. Barumbaru Gahara Atenyi, sees himself as a team player. But you cannot change the youth unless the youth leaders have changed and exemplary. So you, you the youth leaders, you the youth leaders, I know you have a small budget. Let us use that budget uh, meaningfully for development, not for functions. He stresses that he is here to aid the president in fulfilling the manifesto. I am a people minister and I will be a people minister. My door is open to general public every Tuesday. Only on Tuesday, Mondays for cabinet, the rest of the days are for field work. Robert Nyango, UBC News, Kampala. <laughs> All right, now in more news this evening, the Constitutional Court has dismissed a petition filed by a group of activists aimed at nullifying the recently passed Anti-Homosexuality Act. The Parliament of Uganda has lauded the position of the court upon upholding the Anti-Homosexuality Act. I want to thank you, honorable colleagues and uh, Ugandans in general. I want to thank the judiciary. Uh, for not interfering with the work of parliament and, and allowing us to execute our mandate as given to us. And personally, I'm happy that the law has been upheld because it would have been disappointing to nullify the whole law because parliament followed the procedures and we also think it is right to prohibit same-sex relationships and the homosexual relationships. We want to thank the courts for upholding the people's decision because when we passed the Anti-Homosexuality Act, it was based on the various complaints that we had gotten from the people and we as members of parliament, ours is to legislate for the people. And we passed that uh, law aware that it was going to address our challenges because we do not want to see the recruitment of children into homosexuality. Yes, I'm so happy that uh, the courts have really taken a better decision rather than uh, overturning the entire bill that was uh, passed by parliament. This means that they have also realized that homosexuality is not needed in Uganda and parliament went through the right procedures. So I wish to even congratulate all Ugandans over this milestone and even parliament itself because uh, when we come to parliament here we come to represent the views of the people. And the court's judgment is a true demonstration that cultures of Africa must be, read, must be respected. And at the same time the court's judgment is a demonstration that Parliament did the right thing by showing. From Moyo District, so they came to see me in my office. Our Reverend Father Grace Waigo, Chairperson. UBC News tonight takes a very short break, but we still have more stories. Don't move an inch. Fred! Hostmosis. Freddy, Freddy! <laughs> Fred Dola, my boss, CEO Inojo, the general of generals, the conqueror of conquerors, the first and the final, the sky above the skies, the promised land, the terms and the conditions, the international king crocodile, the source of the source What's of the Nile. I don't have money today. <laughs> Just a couple of loan of 200 k to stock my shop. The signs and symptoms of success. The banker commander, not the banker tailor. Why hassle for a loan when you've got MTN Momo? We're sorting it. Use the Momo app or dial star 165 star 5 hash for all quick loans. Choose from the different loan options from our partners and get one that works for you. Together, we're unstoppable. 
the government of Uganda and the Uganda Bureau of Statistics is calling upon all stakeholders such as the chief administrative officers, city mayors, resident city commissioners, city clerks, city and division councillors, wards and LC chairpersons as well as the residents and business communities to cooperate with the UBOS field teams as we embark on advanced preparations to conduct the national population and housing census on the 10th of May 2024. The census will be at 10-day exercise to obtain statistical data and information that will be used for planning and policy formulation including information on 1. How many we are, 2. Where we are, 3. How we are living, 4. What we own and 5. Where we access services from. The Uganda Bureau of Statistics has now started listing of households and mapping in the 11 cities of Arua, Fort Porto, Gulu, Hoima, Jinja, Lira, Mbale, Masaka, Mbarara, Soroti, and in the Greater Kampala comprising of Kampala, Wakiso, and Mukono districts. For more information, please call 0755-342-128 or 0773-342-128. This message is brought to you by the Executive Director and Census Commissioner, Uganda Bureau of Statistics. Census 2024, it matters to be counted. Have you packed, packed? more with Harbour Jelly and Harbour Fog? Yes, we packed, packed. It will protect your skin from skin rashes. Any irritations? No more rashes and irritations. Movit Herbal Jelly and Herbal Soap is rich in natural herbs for a smooth and glowing skin. Movit all day confidence. Hi, Fifi. How are you? I'm fine. Baby, eh? whenever I eat chips and chicken, mm -hmm. I feel stomachache, joint pain, and body weakness. My dear, go to MX Nutrition Center hey. and learn the best food for your body. Hmm. and get treatment according to your blood group. Are you sure? Yes. By the way, do you know your blood group, genotype, and how much you need to exercise? Come to Timex Nutrition Center for professional advice on how to manage your health and immune boosting. At Timex, we treat diseases like diabetes, arthritis, ulcers, obesity, pressure, and many more. For details, find us at our headquarters in Kampala on Nasa Road, Conrad Plaza, second floor. We also have a branch in Barara. Or call us on 0758 819952 or 0778 288361. Time Mix. Be your own doctor. Welcome back from that break and we're glad that you're still with us here in UBC News Tonight. I'm Lorene Masika Kazimoto and my colleague Elizabeth Nakakoni in Sign Language Interpretation. Now in more news this evening, Muslim World League has flagged off relief to Muslim refugees in Chiriandongo to address the pressing humanitarian crisis in Chiriandongo refugee settlement. The relief was handed over to John Bosco Sentamu, an official from the Office of the Prime Minister. The relief support has been flagged off to provide aid to the affected Muslim refugees in refugee settlement areas. And of late, because of the insurgence which you must have heard about in Sudan, we are receiving quite a sizable number of Sudanese refugees. And as you know, the setup there, most of them are Muslims, actually, majority. And from the beginning of January to date, we have settled more than 120,000 Sudanese refugees. Attendees included the head of the chamber of commerce in Uganda and members from various embassies, including Sudan. So as Islamic Chamber of Commerce, we said, let us start with Ramadan. But even after Ramadan, we are continuing the struggle. We are continuing with soliciting items to enable these people stay in these camps. As my students said, we are all potential refugees. We are all potential refugees. Because at any one time, 
Those who come in Uganda, they will come in Kenya, they will, so we are potential refugees. And I want to take this opportunity to call upon humanity worldwide. Please let us observe peace. Uganda's ambassador to Sudan, Dr. Rashid Semudu, appreciated the initiative of the Muslim World League in serving humanity. To thank His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda and the entire government of Uganda for the efforts which has been made for a very long time to host our brothers from various countries who are affected with the wars. And uh, also I seize this opportunity to, to thank uh, Uganda, His Excellency the President, and the concerned authorities. Sudat Kaye, UBC News. Yellow fever vaccination in schools has successfully kicked off as parents and guardians are urged to embrace the exercise. Globally, Uganda is among the 40 countries with the highest burden of yellow fever. We have the details. This mass vaccination against yellow fever is both for children and adults up to 60 years of age. Yellow fever is a viral infection spread by a particular species of mosquito but can be prevented by vaccination. Around Kampala, the exercise kicked off well in schools. The exercise, we've uh, we got a team of about 19 um, health officials who are carrying out the exercise. It's a big team. We are working with the class teachers to ensure that the exercise flows very well. This vaccine has been brought in the population using a campaign, but they are the same vaccines that we give at the facilities. In fact, that is the reason why we are not giving those children who are below one year. However, there are reports that some parents are skeptical about the vaccination exercise. Program, ...which they have to adhere to, and there's a team of, uh, of health officials who are carrying out the exercise, so I'm referring such cases to them for explanation. Maybe they needed more explanation about the exercise. Civil litigation lawyer George Oktoy explains that in this case, there is no need for parents' consent before their children are vaccinated, but rather they are just informed. The International Court of Justice actually say that in certain circumstances, where it's for the good of the community, parents do not need to consent to vaccination, as long as it's for the good of the community. But of course it's for the government to make its case whether or not it's for the good of the community that a child is vaccinated or not. Globally, Uganda is among the four countries with the highest burden of yellow fever, and this is why government and health department partners is investing in mass vaccination exercise. Adia Nagute, UBC. Thank you, Adia. Now the High Court Criminal Division has had Molly Katanga's bail application. She is the wife to the late businessman, Henry Katanga, facing charges of murdering her husband. The court before Judge Isaac Muata has set April 9th, 2024, to deliver a ruling in the matter. On February 9th, 2024, Molly Katanga, the wife of the late businessman Henry Katanga, filed a bail application in the High Court Criminal Division, which was received by the registry among the various grounds listed by the applicant. She highlighted her need for specialized care and supervision due to the injuries she sustained on the day her husband was shot dead. Wednesday morning, the High Court Criminal Division before Judge Isaac Mota had accused this bail application. Molly Katanga appeared in court via Zoom from Luzilla government prison. However, before the application was heard, there was a contention between both parties as regards the affidavit tendered into court by the prosecution done by Detective A.S.P. Apong Bibiana, who alleged that in hospital, the accused was guarded by SFC, a thing which interfered with police's investigations. On the special care of SFC, Kamutu says no. There is a medical report showing what she was doing in hospital. She was admitted with multiple scalp lacerations, fractures on both her upper limbs, was in a state of hypervolemic shock with cami skin. There is no evidence that he has instructions to represent her. 
Because my Lord, we cannot be saying that every advocate in any of the two of us. Through her lawyers, including Elson Kalhanga, Molly Katanga presented four surelities, Dr. John Patrick Kabayo, Honorable Margaret Muhanga, and retired Major General Emmanuel Burundi. The first surety we shall present to the court shall be the Honorable Dr. John Patrick Kabayo. Prosecution led by Councillor Jonathan Mwaganya objected to the bail application, citing the upcoming trial, among other grounds. A matter that has already been fixed for hearing, the ends of justice would demand that we focus resources on the, he on the main hearing of the case. The surety that should be capable of exerting influence over the applicant of extreme advanced age at 75, who should not be burdened by the laborious duties. Judge Isaac Mortar, after considering submissions from both sides, scheduled April 9, 2024, to deliver a ruling in Molikatanga's bail application. Molikatanga is accused with four others, including her two daughters, Patricia Nkwanzi and Martha Kakwanza, Dr. Charles Otai, and their home security guard, Manure George, Rebecca Nantongo, Susan Inabugude, UBC News. Well, UBC News tonight takes another short break, but return with more stories. Ebisira vyo kuzayaba na masomero, tebite kwa kuka rubiriza na katono. Eno kusimba nyiriri mpamfu, kino kalipa kano kabibuka. Simanya kuzunga na banka siripsi. Kati osomu lo kusasula school fees zo mwana wo, ateno okola na ebila lantoko, kusimu ye yomu ngalo. Icho kula changu nyo, nyiga unyizi sita, emu mwaka tanu, sita, munana noti hash. Huko menelebi kula giridwa, huko zese apu ya MTN momo. Hati kati okula churu waliru. MTN Mobile Money Uganda Limited, erunga misipa banka nkuruwe ya Uganda. Attention everyone, the Ministry of Health has planned to vaccinate all persons aged 1 year to 60 years old to protect them against yellow fever disease. The mass vaccination will take place in 53 districts in these regions. Kampala, Buganda, Teso, Ankole and Karamoja. Vaccination is free and available at all government health facilities and outreach posts in these regions. The vaccination campaign will take place from April 2nd to April 8th, 2024. The vaccine is safe, effective and free of charge and has been approved by World Health Organization and Ministry of Health. This message is from Ministry of Health with support from Gavi. Are you planning or in the process of traveling abroad for work? Using irregular channels to find and travel for work abroad often seems cheaper and faster, but you risk being trafficked, mistreated, or forced to do work you did not agree to. Using proper channels is safer, offers more protection, and better access to support services when problems arise. Do not be deceived. Choose the proper channels. Always verify all information before traveling abroad for work by contacting the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, your local district labor office or DSO's office. You can also visit EEMIS website on eemis.mglsd.go.ug. This message is brought to you by the International Labor Organization with support from the Government of Switzerland.
Welcome back from that break. Now, in more news this evening, the Uganda Wildlife Conservation Education Center has announced new entry charges effective from the 1st of July 2024, aimed at ensuring the proper sustainability of the center and boosting domestic tourism. Dr. James Musinguzi, the executive director of UEC, revealed plans to introduce new animals such as wild dogs and kangaroos at the zoo to enhance visitors' experience. Now, these remarks were made during a press a media press briefing at the center. Take a look. The school children are going to be paying, they have been paying 4,000, they are going to be paying 8,000 shillings. The East African adults have been paying 10,000, they are going to be paying 20,000. The East African children have been paying 5,000, we are now going to be paying 10,000. Uganda Wildlife Conservation Education Center, formerly known as Entebbe Zoo, has announced new entry fees to enhance services, visitors' experiences, and animal welfare starting from July 1st, 2024. Dr. James Musinguzi, the executive director, highlighted that it took the center close to 10 years to adjust the entry fees. Along the way, we had a tariff change for the tourists that are coming up from abroad, especially uh, after COVID-19, but the Ugandan rate was not touched. Now, time has come for us as Ugandans to support the operations of the zoo because we have been charging money that is not able to bring back a significant revenue to help us run the center in terms of animal welfare, each animal that you see in the zoo has got a diet manual, it has got a health manual. Those requirements on the diet must be met. The requirements on the animal health card must be met. For example, we are supposed to do animal health checks for all our animals every year. Surely, a kilo of meat, one kilo of meat, hmm, is about 15,000 shillings. 15,000. Now, for you to feed one lion, you need 100,000 shillings a day. Really, we, we need to understand the context and support the zoo and support conservation in Uganda. Former Entebbe Zoo is set to introduce new animals in addition to the existing ones like wild dogs, kangaroos, among others. With funding from the government of Uganda and the World Bank, work has embarked on a new journey to improve infrastructure like revamping its road network, enhancing and strengthening giraffe holdings, elephant holdings, expanding the animal hospital and building a biobank. Right now, the project is at 60% completion. 60% completion. And this is a World Bank loan that is supposed to be paid back. And UAC uh, received a total of 14 billion shillings under this project. So the procurement and project management is done by the Project Tessa Foundation in Kampala. Zahara Abigaba, UBC News. Now, last week, Casita traders announced that they will strike on the 16th of April 2024 if their persistent grievances are not worked up upon by government. Now, though the most pronounced grievances is high taxes, the traders say it's more than that. Our reporter has more. From IFRIS to unfavorable policies, the traders say everything is affecting their businesses. <laughs> Atesoka, oleta ba kubalire, ba kubalire ili city, ba kuingiza katika mtu tu mani na computer. Tume chagiza ba tasa somba ba tu gobi ya mubiznesi. Ili city ba jinyi gina mchinto hichi dala, ba chile tere mchinto, msolo mlaala. Fava tu ba ukfu ukfu yamu stowa. Katika tiba gala ili city ba jinyi gina mbaya ili city. Government tu yamila wanga ba tu biya mstowa. Unfair trade policies. Because there is no way you can invite investors and the investors cannot respect trade policies. Let manufacturers be manufacturers. We don't want Chinese to retail. We don't want Chinese to do distribution. So the government should take appropriate measures to stop that. There is an issue of IFLIS right now. IFLIS is not a tax. But it's a measure which the government is implementing to see that there is transparency in bookkeeping, accounting and others. 
But the problem is that they, they are rushing it to the traders who still have that negative perspective towards, uh, towards it. Strikes have not worked. Meetings with government have not yielded anything. And traders feel they have been in this situation for a long time. Uh, we clearly petitioned parliament, president, the ministers, uh, the presidential protection unit, all of them, they have detailed petitions. But you find that the response of the government so far hasn't yet satisfied our members. If no solution is found and conditions continue like this, the traders will be forced out of business. For the to our government in Gaio, a delay into be a gendable factory, a quam solo murund yog, a chavata biscuit yech, but Chiva Chiva Denga, which to Guzagumuch Tund, Chijuan on Gachami to Arejo, the Nyongerecon Suzanga Vitano, Tiberenga Chevi Vitan, Timayan to Msolo Bakurati, Babu Yako. Just imagine the traders in Navogabo when they go out of business, what happens? They become empty, the traders will not be able to meet their obligation because the sales are low. More Ugandans will become unemployed, so even the crime rate. So just when you try to compute fighting crime, what, what, I think a lot will be lost. So we just appeal to the government that it urgently handle these minor challenges because these things are very simple. There is no need of the government prolonging to handle these challenges so that the traders can trade in harmony. The traders have planned to strike on the 16th of April 2024 if they fail to meet the president later this month. Grace Joyce Kemgisa, UBC News. Ugandans have been encouraged to embrace the purchase of local products to support local manufacturers in order to generate more revenue. State Minister for Investment and Privatization Evelyn Anita says this will create more employment opportunities and reduce on the imports into the country. She was speaking while officiating at the opening of the new showroom for Modern Tiles in Bugulovi, a suburb of Kampala. <laughs> Welcoming to the eye are various brands and designs of tiles manufactured locally here in Uganda. They are displayed to show the country's quest to address its building needs. To officially open this modern tile showroom is State Minister for Investment and Privatization. Evelyn Anite. One, two, three, zero. And what is exciting is that the raw materials for making 90% of the raw materials are formed here. So that means that we are speaking the language of doing value addition on our God given natural resources. We're talking about stones, we're talking about, uh, about clay. The tiles are manufactured at Modern Tiles, a local manufacturing plant recently commissioned by the president in the central district of Buikwe. Ashish Monpara is the modern group chairman. Today uh, we have bought in the uh, investment more than 30 million dollars in this project and uh, created direct and indirect jobs of 3,000 uh, local Ugandans. And uh, we buy almost 90% of raw material within Uganda and we become the major no, substitute for the importation of time. Both the minister and the outgoing chairman, Uganda Investment Authority, Morrison Rakakamba, agree that such a milestone is timely. Every time Uganda traders wanted to buy tiles because they do not have good quality, what you call premium tiles in the country, they have had to convert their savings into dollars so as to be able to go out to China, to, 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 to Italy, uh, mention the country, to be able to import these tiles or to India. But now we have saved that money. We're going to invest it here within Uganda. The prices have de decreased drastically because tiles from Spain, from Italy, uh, from the UK, from China, the square meter is around 150,000. 
to, to get some of these uh, ultra modern tiles. But now we have ultra modern tiles manufactured by modern tiles here in Uganda. The square meter, two square meters are 25,000 Uganda shillings. Uganda remains on course towards economic progress and the manufacturing sector is one of the avenues. Henry Okrut, UBC. And now into the world of sports. The FUFA executive is conducting a countrywide tour of the eight regional football associations. The routine engagement with the lower league clubs and other football stakeholders also includes members of the regional football associations. And this Wednesday afternoon, the team was in the eastern part of the country. From the eastern part of the country, they will visit West Nile, a northern region, southern part of Uganda, finding solutions to nurturing talent. Visualizations, administration, coaching and referring. We believe that these ideas are going to make our way forward much better going forward. Really very happy that the president has come to the grassroots to hear from, this, from the people running football at the grassroots. Indeed, referees, I mean the owners of the clubs have been complaining of, of payment of referees and I think they have heard from the host's mouth about the payment of referees. Then, uh, I'm also very happy in the way he was conducting his meetings because if you say something and someone raises an objection, he gives an opportunity for that person to be heard. I'm happy that today everybody who has attended this meeting is a winner because we are footballing people and everybody is going to get a ball to take at home. And like the president said, his, his mission is to see that everybody in the home has a ball. So as chairman Eastern Region, I support and I support the idea of everybody having the ball at home because without a ball, then there would be no football in the eastern region. Now, the long-awaited draws of the quarterfinals of the Stambik Uganda Cup have been held at the FUFA House in Mengo. Uganda Premier League top sides have been drawn against each other. Vipers Sports Club will visit Kitara FC at Masindi, while KCCA will visit, will visit as well. Kitara has had a good run in the current Premier League season and indeed it is a fixture that many sports enthusiasts are looking out for. KCCA FC, on the other hand, look at the Uganda Cup as the trophy within reach and will do whatever it takes to wash off Bull FC. The other quarterfinal will be between Big League side Football FC and Neck FC. The games will be played between the 10th uh, to the 14th of April, while there will be an extra time for 30 minutes in case of a draw and possibly a penalty shootout thereafter. Well, here is the man himself. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Timothy? I'm well. How are you, Lorraine? I'm very well, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Have I said Happy New Month? No, you haven't. Happy New Month. Welcome back from Easter. Quite tiresome, but restful, been. though. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, it is a Wednesday again, and uh, Ugandans are waiting to watch the biggest show in the land tonight. What do you have in store for us today? So have you heard of the budget? Yes, I have. Every I'm year around this time, we come towards the end of the budget cycle. So mm -hmm. about uh, the 28th of this month, it will come to an end with the, the, uh, the committee. Then it will go to the floor of parliament. Mm -hmm. 58.1 trillion shillings. That's a lot of money. More, six trillion more than the last one. Exactly. 
But also we have five new taxes. So generally, how much money are you willing to spend? On fuel, on bottled water, excise duty, you have land. So generally, if you're selling land that is not for home use, yes. there's a 5% withholding tax. That's the discussion. We want to check on the achievements and the shortfalls of the last budget because mm -hmm. URA has been falling short on collections and what the measures are. So I'm excited. I have a good panel. I really have the permanent tell, secretary mm -hmm. and uh, the secretary to the treasury, Ramadan Gobi. He'll be here with us. I have economists in the building. And since I am one, it's really So we're fitting. talking to the right people tonight. Economics is all we're going to be discussing tonight. All right. Yes. Well, we can't wait. And I hope you can't wait as well. Uh, team, meet up with uh, Timothy Nyangweso on Behind the Headlines tonight at 10. From me and the team working tirelessly behind the screen, we wish you a good night. 2023-2024 financial year. Brace yourself for the unveiling of the 2024-2025 draft budget, soaring to 58.3 trillion Ugandan shillings, marking a significant increase of 3 trillion from the previous financial year. With a supplementary budget approval of 15 trillion shillings, the burning questions arise. What justifies this surge? Where does the tax base lie? And what's in store for future supplements? Join us into the journey to depth of physical insight with Timothy Nyangweso and our panel of experts on Behind the Headlines. A pioneer panelist of your favorite program, Behind the Headlines, an astute economist. He has taught economics at various universities and now Uganda's permanent secretary and secretary to the treasury, Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, Ramadan Gobi. He is a Ugandan development economist and proud alumnus of Makere University. He is a lecturer of economics and director business forum at Makere University School of Business at the College of Business. Dr. Fred Muhumuza, a journalist, politician and now member of parliament representing Gulu West, Badenge Layibi Division. He previously served as the chairman of Gulu District Local Government, Honorable Martin Ojara Mapenduzi. A Ugandan economist, politician and member of parliament representing the people of Butambala. He also serves as member of public accounts committee in parliament, Honorable Muwanga Muhammad Chivumbi. She is an associate professor and dean school of women and gender studies and the director center of excellence in notions of identity at Makere University. She is also a social scientist with a PhD in international health studies, a selfless citizen, Professor Sarah Sally. Don't miss this depth of physical insight on your favorite weekly program, Behind the Headlines. All on your public broadcaster, UBC, inspiring Uganda. UBC. Inspiring Uganda.